Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Sheridan Ganger, the Director of Marketing here at HelpShift. I am thrilled to be joined today by Aaron uh, Wasnowski, uh, the founder and iOS developer of Musee. Welcome, Aaron. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. As I just said, we're super excited uh, for you to share with us your secret sauce on how to consistently get five stars across the board. Um, but before we get going, um, I just want to cover a couple of logistics. Uh, this is our third webinar in our series of five as we gear up for GDC here in March around the corner. Um, so Aaron, again, thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to seeing everybody on our last two webinars. So stay tuned for more information uh, in the next couple of days. So this is a live Hangout, but it is being recorded. So if you have a friend or a colleague that can't make today's live event, don't worry. We will post it up on our blog as well as our social channels after the event. And we will be sure to send it to everybody who is registered as well. We want this to be as interactive as possible, so that means we are encouraging everybody on the call to share with us your questions or comments throughout the event uh, on Twitter using the hashtag GDC15. We have our experts working in the background to make sure that all of your questions and comments get addressed. And Aaron, we will definitely open up for Q&A after the event. So um, again, we encourage everyone to participate. It's not just Aaron and I on this call, it's all of you as well. Any other things, Aaron, before we get started? I think you covered it. Awesome. So let's just dive in. Musi, how did it come about? You know, where was the idea born? Yeah, so I was originally in high school when Musi started. And at that point in time, everybody used YouTube for music. Mm -hmm. All my friends, everyone I knew, they were all using YouTube. Because it was right on the onset of Vivo. And sort of when Vivo was becoming huge and bringing on all their new artists. So everyone used YouTube. And sort of the idea just came about, what if you could actually listen to these amazing YouTube songs that we all listen to on our computers, except on our iPhones? Mm -hmm. And at that time, everyone also had iPod touches, and just everyone had an iDevice. So Musi was eventually born. And I wanted to just harness YouTube's entire giant library of remixes and new music. And, and so came Musi. Awesome. That's great. Thanks so much for sharing. Our audience always likes to have a little bit of background to uh, learn about the speaker on our event. So thank you. So users, how did you think about acquiring users? How did you kind of get that message out there to people to actually encourage them to go to the App Store and download Musi? Yeah, so our number one sort of goal with Musi was to make it huge on TV and on blogs and just everyone would know about it just from reading about it, but that didn't go too well. We had a little bit of local news coverage since I'm, I'm 19 years old, so it was sort of big for a teenager to actually build an app. So I sort of leveraged myself, but as soon as that died down, there wasn't really much that we could do. So I had to turn to more natural and more organic sources of getting users. And that's what I've stuck with over the last two years. Can you give a couple examples of some of those? Yeah, for sure. So basically just making it so Musi is able to be found on the App Store and also have it so Musi is a good enough app that people actually like to share and talk about it with their friends because word of mouth is huge for apps. Absolutely, absolutely. I know that we're always talking about what apps are our favorite for the week here in the office. So can you talk a little bit about the experience and even the pain points that you had as Musi started to scale and you started seeing your MAUs grow? Yeah, so it was kind of funny at the start. We have a very small server component, but as soon as I saw just a little spike of users, I noticed Musi's just died <laughs> instantly. So the biggest part was actually realizing that I need a good server. And past that, it, just seeing it grow was amazing, just because I, I felt personally connected to everyone that used it. And slowly on social media and on other channels, I would see people talking about it. So it was a slow but steady growth process. And it was just amazing seeing it being used more and more and more and more around the world. Awesome. And you mentioned you know, getting a new server. Do you have any other kind of tips and tricks for people as they're thinking about launching an app? Some of the things that you, maybe you wish you had known? Um, don't go on $5 shared hosting for your web server. <laughs> I'm not a sysadmin. I'm very, very hobbyist when it comes to servers, so I don't really have much good insight. Just don't do shared hosting because it's terrible and everyone's laughing at me right now. <laughs> that's okay. my best. No, that's great. Um, so in the conversations that we've had over the past couple of weeks as we 
prepare for today's event. Um, we've talked about ratings. That's a number one thing that comes up. One, because I'm, you know, I'm very impressed that you have five star ratings across the board. I mean, just all top notch ratings. So can you tell us a little bit about them? Did you just get one star, or did people actually take the time to give you detailed feedback, personal feedback that you can use to grow your app? Mm -hmm. So when prompting users for ratings, and I know we'll get into this later, but I really wanted to focus on just not getting everyone instantly to ask about rating the app. I wanted people to actually engage with Musi and to become connected with it mm -hmm. before actually getting that prompt to rate it. And what I noticed is that people would take a lot of time out of their day to specifically describe what they loved about the app. Some people would do multiple paragraphs in this app review telling us what they loved about it. And I've noticed that very few people will actually just rate it that, that couple stars and then move on. People always want to actually share their experience with it now to change their lives. Awesome. Um, so as your app evolved, like how did you keep it at peak? Like was there ebb and flow? Did you have highs? Did you have lows? And how did you kind of conquer that to make sure that you always stayed at that top? Yeah, the number one, the number one rule was always for us was listening to our customers. <laughs> Um, because they're ultimately the people that keep our product alive. So it was constantly iterating and taking in their ideas, seeing what was viable, what had enough appeal, and then moving forward and adding that into the app, or even removing features that we saw just confused it and dragged the app away from its original intention. So it was that constant iteration that allowed us to always stay one step ahead of the game, since we would listen to our users, and then they'd see an update a week later with the suggestion they had, and then they'd talk to their friends, too. So it expands greatly just by constantly iterating. Awesome. So um, another thing that we talked a lot about was keywords. So before you guys went live with Musi, you guys talked a lot about keywords and, and how to go about testing them. Can you share with our audience your experience and kind of some of the tips and tricks that you found worked the best? Yeah. So. Um, Initially, with keywords, we just wanted to sort of think of what would our users search for if they were searching um, for an app like Musi. So there were a lot of different terms that we saw were used. And we used App Annie and a bunch of other services that sort of ranked app keywords, showed you how competitive they were, et cetera. So we noticed some people would search for MP3 downloading, which is, at the end of the day, they want songs. So we would target our keywords for, say, MP3 downloading, even though it didn't directly relate to Musi. So we just think of all the different search terms and the different ideas that people would have when they're actually searching for Musi. So for example, we'd go and tell our friends, hey, if you wanted to search for Musi on the App Store and you didn't know it was named Musi, what would you type? And then based on what they typed, we actually knew sort of what phrases people would search for. And that's how we targeted our keywords. And then ultimately, we would actually, because you can't really see how your keywords are going to do before mm -hmm. they get in the App Store. So with our constant iteration cycle, we would always change up our keywords, update to update, and see what stuck. So finally, when we did a big update that's going to stay on the store for a while, we'll put it to the best keywords that we found in the last 10 bug fix updates. Great. That's that's great insight, um, and I hope our audience uh, agrees. Um, so from testing the launch, what did you really learn, and how did you kind of capture that feedback for your product roadmap? Yeah, so we had a bunch of ideas in terms of what we thought people would actually like for Musi, and some of them were interesting, sort of like the Snapchat of music where you can send music to your friends and everyone had accounts. But what we realized at the end of the day is people just want to listen to music, and that's mm -hmm. what we ended up tailoring our experience around. Because we had all these amazing ideas ourselves that we thought people would like. But at the end of the day, we had to listen to our users because they were saying they didn't want some convoluted way to go and listen to their music, even with they had more features. They mm -hmm. just wanted to be able to get their library. And that's why it's dead simple. You open the app, and there's your library. So feedback matters greatly because you just have to create something that your users love at the end of the day. So you have to listen to your users to do that, and that's something that we've done with Musi. Awesome, Aaron. Thank you. Um, discoverability. We started touching on it a little bit when we started talking about keywords, but there are so many music apps available. How are you confident that you could get users to download Musi and not only that, continue using it on a day-to-day -day basis? We initially weren't confident in terms of our keywords because we knew there were so many other apps out there that kind of did what Musi did. And that's especially true within the last year to year and a half when there's sort of been an 
giant wave of these music streaming apps that come in the store. So what our idea was is, you know what, if we can't beat them in terms of, say, just generic, like, here's the search rating, because we're always kind of a little lower, let's beat them in quality. And that's what we focused on, and that's actually mattered in the long run, because people will tell their friends about our app name if they know they like it. So mm -hmm. my number one rule has always been, let's just build a better product than everyone else, and let's just focus on the fine-grained details that all these other apps that are fast to market go and fail to do. And that's allowed us to know that we're the better product out there, and people are going to download us. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, so it's definitely a step-by-step -step process, and we've started outlining the steps. But to get noticed in the App Store, is there an optimal time for submission? You know, what should people be thinking about when, as you said, they've done all the due diligence to build a great app. Now it's time to make it available. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, you know, what we've tried to always do has been target weekends, sort of like Fridays for release. So we'd say put it in the review queue. We'd go to appreviewtimes.com, see sort of where the reviews are. Because if it's at eight days, we'll say we'll put it in on Saturday, the week before we want to launch, mm -hmm. so it launches on a Friday. I don't know. Maybe people download a lot of apps on Fridays. Maybe people don't. But we have always noticed like a little spike when an update goes out on that day. So I don't know scientifically if there's an optimal time for submission, but I always try to target weekends, just sort of when people have more free time. I've also had luck even with other times going on a Monday because we're a music app, so people go into work, hate that it's silent, and then try to find a music app to stop yeah. that. So it really depends on the app, and uh, and you can test that out for yourself to see how users respond to your release times. OK, great. So OK, so we've covered the like, time submission. We talked about you know keywords. Now let's talk about the name. The name of an app, right? It's going to be with you, you know, for however long your app is out there. So how much goes into creating a name? How much, you know, what what do you think about when you created Musi? Did you have other initial names that you were trying? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so we had a bunch of different ideas um, in terms of our name. And, and I'm actually really, really, really happy that we landed on Musi because I think it's a wonderful name. And surprisingly, it was taken by nothing else. So we had thrown around sort of you, like different variations on YouTube. I know YouTube was one of them, and then also like maybe even a music amplifier, like a bunch of music terms. And then finally, I thought, which is kind of funny, uh, Musi has like all these different meanings. I was like, hey, let's just do Musi without the C. And then I realized, hey, that's music without the C, because we like play YouTube, but you can't watch the video. So like it's music without the C, right? Okay. So I like, I like, all these different ideas. But honestly, I don't think that like the base app name matters too much, um, because at the end of the day, people download your app for your app, not the name. So if you can have a cool name, great. But if you don't, then it's not really that detrimental. I think as long as people can say your name, that's important. Okay. That's a good tip right there. You need to be able to pronounce it, right? Yeah. And regarding a tagline, I think that's been one of the hugest changes in Musi. For the first little while in the App Store, I thought I was going to be all cool and have just Musi <laughs> and everyone would know what it was because we're like the equivalent of Facebook. Like, come on, everyone knows what that is. But no, that it didn't work like that. We got like 30 downloads a day because people would see Musi in this obscure M and be like, at next app, I'll go to free yeah. Musi Downloader Plus. Like, it didn't make sense to just have the product name. So as soon as I introduced a tagline behind it, downloads went five times, six times, because now people actually knew what it was. So we have a cool little app name, and make your app name like as small as you can and just give people info about what it is in the name. It's been huge for us. And is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry. And also refining that was huge, too. For the first little while, Musi was always Musi dash um, song streaming for YouTube and downloader for SoundCloud. Now, that made sense as the development team, because like that's what our app did. But as a user, I sort of had an epiphany. I'm like, no one knows. Like, no one's actually searching for a YouTube streamer and like song MP3 downloader. Like, they want free music. So I changed the tagline to Musi, unlimited free music. And hey, downloads, again, went 10 times, 15 times what they were originally. So taglines are huge. That's made a humongous difference. And constantly iterating your tagline as well. Like for multiple app updates, I would just go boom, boom, boom. Let's see what works. 
and, and then I settle on one that works really well. Great, Aaron. And that, to everybody on the call, that is a great lesson learned. And if you're taking notes, I would say definitely write that down. Use taglines. All right, Aaron. Visual impact in the App Store can carry you a long way. Um, can you share with us your experience and you were thinking about your visual kind of strategy? Yeah, for sure. So with Musi historically, again, before I sort of put time into my App Store page, it was just screenshots of the plain app, like here it is. And I mean, again, as the development team, it's like, we know what that is. That's your library of music. Like every user is going to know what that is, but they don't. So it wasn't too effective in terms of our screenshots because you just see a list of music and you didn't really know, hey, is that my list? Is that like music I can only play in the app? So one of the hugest parts is actually sort of just on setting that screenshot on an iPhone and then adding a little line above saying what it is. Now, I know Apple doesn't recommend this in their guidelines. They say don't do this, but they let it in. And it works, too, because everyone looks through screenshots. And if you can give people more info about your app in the screenshots, then more power to you. Um, and then one thing I noticed as well is really targeting or tailoring our screenshots to our demographic. So mm -hmm. initially, we just had a gray background on the screenshots. It looked crisp. It looked clean. And we realized that that would be great for a financial management application, not this awesome rock and music streaming app. So then I got this awesome picture of a concert, blurred it, and now we have this crazy concert background that looks like it's on fire. And it's amazing. So <laughs> actually knowing your demographic and sort of what who they are, we're, we're targeting teenagers. And creating something that matches your app is huge. And we're taking time on those screenshots is, is awesome itself. And it doesn't take a lot of know-how either. Great. Um, just to dig into that a little more, um, how many screenshots did you come up with? How, you know, how often did you change them? Um, I yeah. know you mentioned that you, you thought about it, and there was definitely some a thought process behind it. But now, as you guys have been, you know, active for two years, how how are you changing it and keeping things exciting? Yeah. You know. Um, Honestly, I, we went through a little bit of an iteration process, and we've sort of, sort of settled on screenshots that we think work. So at this point, I don't plan on changing them too, too much. Maybe slight wording changes just to see what sticks in between updates. But other than that, once you can get to screenshots that, that would work, because again, we did see a jump in users just with the change in screenshots. Um, so as soon as we're at this point, um, we're sort of just going to stick there. OK, great. Um, so we've talked about taglines, we've talked about screenshots. Now let's get into descriptions. How much of a role do they play in App Store optimization? Honestly, as a, on a personal level, I haven't found any change uh, or any correlation in user downloads in your app description. I've just had um, sort of what people have said about it, like a couple great ratings and then their iTunes name. And I haven't found anything that actually affects downloads more than that. So uh, when it comes to your description, I would just like what we do is we outline features, give a little info about the app, and then and then that's that. So I haven't found that description really matters too too much. Okay, but definitely you should think about it correlating to your name and as you said, yeah, if you can, I think quotes go a long way because they sort of reinforce that other people are using this app as well. Yeah. And this is what they're saying about it. So if you can put some great quotes up there, then that helps a lot. Absolutely. It shows it gives you that kind of validation piece uh, that people look exactly. for when they're, when they're evaluating different apps. Um, yeah. So this is just kind of a fun question. I probably should have asked it a little bit earlier, but you changed the name of your app 10 times before deciding Musi. Um, any any you know last minute tips and tricks for our audience, you know, to you know, how do you know when you found the name that's gonna stick? Um I guess you just have to sort of go. Well, you don't know. I mean, there might be something way better than Musi that gets us like 20 times the download. So we, we just sort of iterated to a point where we're comfortable with the amount of downloads that it gets, and we're comfortable with how it appears on the App Store, sort of what it presents for our brand. And uh, yeah, but constantly iterating your app name, at least when you're starting up. Not, I guess not the app name itself. Like, we wouldn't change Musi around a ton, but just that tagline and that app, app name that shows on the store. It's huge because you can you have the ability to just test out, and then in some cases you'll see giant spikes in downloads. Awesome. Um, so we all know the fascination with the five star rating. Uh, you envision a product, you build it, you put it on the app store. They sell it. 
So how can you and your developers and your team sell your app to, you know, to secure those top ratings? Yeah, so I did a big blog post on this, and I'll sort of just reiterate some points um, that were in there. Uh, one of the biggest things, well, it was probably the biggest change that I've seen with Musi in the last year has just been this single change in how do we prompt users to rate our app. So I noticed that we like, historically we had an iRate or app rater. Those are two names of these rating um, frameworks. So you just pop up at the start of your app launch saying, hey, if you like this app, please rate it. And what we found is that converted terribly. Like less than 1% of people would actually go and follow through with this. Because thinking as a user, when I open your app, I'm opening it to use it. I don't want to open it and then rate it. Because I don't have a lot of time. I'm, I'm a busy user. So what we thought about is, OK, let's just wipe this out. And let's think, what's the best point that we can ask our user to rate our app? Because we're not a game where you, we can sort of prompt you, say, after a level's done or after you get to a certain point. Because, I mean, there's no milestones in music streaming. <laughs> so what we came up with is, what point is the user happiest with our app? And we thought that that would be as soon as you play a song. Because you go to Musi to get all this free music from YouTube and SoundCloud. So when it actually works and you listen to your free song, that's great. And you're going to be happy about that. So that's exactly what we do. Um, we just make sure the user has enough engagement with our app before asking this, because sort of building up that, so they know about our app, essentially. And then when they play a song, we just pop up a non-intrusive pop-up. So I guess pop-up isn't the right word. But we show them just a non-intrusive banner, just saying, hey, would you like to rate Musi? Or, sorry, 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 actually, do you like Musi? Because first of all, we only want the, like people that actually like the app to go on the app store. Mm -hmm. And then if they say, sure, then we say, would you like to rate it? And if they say no, we never ask them ever, ever again, because we don't want to be annoying. And if they say yes, then we send them to the App Store. And then if they say they're not enjoying music, so back like a couple steps, then we'll ask them, hey, would you like to give us some feedback? So we can actually build information about why our customers are dissatisfied, and then convert them into actual satisfied customers. And then between app versions, because every time you release a new version of your app, Right? There, your ratings are cleared, and you have to start fresh, and your app looks all new and ugly. So what we wanted to do is ask our users that rated us again. So we just changed the wording really slightly to, are you still enjoying music? So that kind of, no, to them, they would think that we actually, like, we, well, we do care. But it makes it look like the app is just constantly monitoring them and making sure they're engaged. And most times people, yes, I'm still enjoying music, and yes, I'll rate you again. Because they've already gone through that once. Absolutely, that's that's great. And you know, as I was saying to our audience, here's yeah. another hack to remember. And definitely, hope you were taking notes on that. And if not, don't worry, we're recording it so you can uh, go back and listen to Aaron's suggestions. Um, before I get into my next question, I just want to remind our audience that we want this to be interactive. It's about you as well. So please uh, submit your questions and comments on Twitter using the hashtag GDC15. And we have our experts working in the background to get those answered. And we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. Um, so thank you. Uh, let's continue to talk about feedback. You know, it's so important in success, especially you know for for the story that you've been telling us with Musi. And it really comes down to triggers and triggering responses in a certain way at a certain time, as you just mentioned. So Circa got this right, and you talked about it in your Medium post. Can you explain how you were influenced by Circa and how you continue to maintain that in your app today? Yeah. So Circa was one of the well, they were the company that actually influenced this change because we had seen what they did with their rating prompt, and we did something very, very similar. So we had sort of analyzed in their app where they would ask users for ratings. So in Circa's app, they would go in between your little news posts because, I mean, that's a good time for them too because you're reading news, and if you read enough news, it'll say, hey, do you like our app? Yeah, we do. So we did something very similar, and, and one of our ideas was to just directly copy Circa and put it right in the library in between your songs. But we thought, hey, hey, people haven't chosen a song yet. Like, they don't like music enough for this. So that's why we went and we put it in the music player. Um, so yeah, Circa was one of the people that actually influenced, or they were the, <laughs> the company that influenced this change. And yeah, so feedback and ratings and making it actually at a good time with a nice looking prompt, it goes such a long way. It's huge. 
Awesome. And, and copying is the best form of flattery, right? So um, I'm sure that they can honor I'm Sorry, Circa. I didn't <laughs> step on any toes. <laughs> no, I'm saying that you know you're you you copied what works, right? And and they know what works. So um, I'm sure they'll be very, very happy to hear that. Um, at the end of the day, though, we know that you can't keep every user happy. It's just it's not possible. But what is possible is turning that bad into some good, whether it's for your product roadmap, as you mentioned, and it's for other things. So what are some of the really positive outcomes that can arise from kind of that negative feedback? Yeah, so um, initially, as soon as I launched this rating prompt, we saw a spike in people contacting us because um, they would be like, no, I'm not enjoying Musi. Here's why. So a bunch of people would explain, say, hey, I don't like your, I don't like how you can't play anything offline. Mm -hmm. At which point we would explain to them, hey, this is the reason we do this, and we also, but you can achieve this through this. So in most cases, people didn't like the app because they just didn't know how it worked. So by actually emailing them back, we were able to clarify it. And I noticed so many people would respond back, hey, it works now. Thank you. I love this app. And then I would toss them a link to the app and say, hey, if you like it, please give us a rating. Like, let us let others know how you feel. And we would actually convert so many people that were dissatisfied into actually happy customers that went and rated us five stars on the store. So following up with people that you've fixed and just telling them, hey, here's a, here, rate us. It goes such a long way, and most times they will because they actually feel personally connected to you. And another way, if we couldn't actually go and fix a user's problem directly, but say they actually did have a legitimate qualm about the app, that, hey, we can't fix this, we're sorry. Musi has ads, so I would give them a code to remove ads for free from the app. And that would just show to them that I cared. Most times they were actually super, super happy about this. It again would rate us five stars. <laughs> so just giving people like a reward for actually taking the time out of their day to email you, you would convert all so many customers that are unhappy into just very, very happy users. That's that's great information. You know, in fact, forty percent, forty six percent of the negative reviews are actually feedback for you guys. So to hear that you took that feedback and you know reached out to your community in such a personal way, there's a great lesson to be learned there. And I know that we'll get into that you know towards the end of our our webinar here. Uh, but thanks for sharing that, Aaron. All right. So the first webinar of our series, I interviewed Glue, which have no issues with user acquisition. In our second webinar, I hosted Luminary, for which they told me they spend about a million bucks on user acquisition when they were first launching. You told me that you had no budget, zero budget for user acquisition, but you managed to get to 100,000 monthly active users in six months. Please tell us your secrets. Yeah, you know, I'm a college student, right? So I don't have a million bucks. <laughs> I wish I did. I could do a lot with it, Glue, if you want to throw that my way. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I had no money for user acquisition. I tried to leverage myself as an indie app developer that built this app, and I mean, that went a little bit, and then I would try to leverage other communities like Reddit and just users themselves, but again, that only goes so far. So at the end of the day, I just focused on the one thing that I could, I really knew I, that I could do, and that was product development and just building and reinforcing my brand. And eventually, slowly but surely, the results came in, and it worked. Great, great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Any other last thoughts on, on that? I know it ties a lot into community. Um, would you care to speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, for sure. So as soon as I would always release updates, I, I'm a Reddit user, so I would go on, say, Reddit iPhone or Reddit apps or whatever, and I would just share, hey, this update's released. A couple times, I, I noticed that didn't get a lot of traction past initial release because I felt like I was kind of spouting them. So I'd even throw promo codes their way. I'd say, hey, here's unlimited promo codes. If you want to remove ads, just enter the code Reddit in the music. And then that converted huge. So just giving back to these communities and showing them that you're listening to their feedback and you care, that was huge for me because I didn't actually have the ability to go and put music on billboards, <laughs> right? So, so just engaging communities and engaging people, it went a, a really long way. I actually, as soon as uh, I stopped this recently, but on, on the Musi's Twitter, I would go and I would search everyone that said the word music app on Twitter, and I would tweet them back and be like, hey, if you like music, you should get Musi. And again, that's just connecting with your customers directly. And again, so many people would go and download it from us. 
and these are people that I would have no idea that we existed. So basically just Twitter and online communities and Reddit and just message boards. They're huge if you have no money for user acquisition. Absolutely. For everybody on the call, that is a huge lesson learned right there. Um, if one person, Aaron, can do it, I am confident that everybody else can as well. It's about adding that personal touch and that thank you. You know, as, as Mom always said, it thank you goes a long ways, and it helped you get to 100,000 MAUs in, in six months. So uh, lesson learned there for the folks on the phone. Um, before we turn it to the Q&A, uh, before we turn to our audience for Q&A, I need to ask if the there's one thing that you could have done before, or if you could have spent a little bit more time on one piece of this puzzle, what would it have been? Yeah, so the number one thing that I can think of right now is doing it before I actually did it. So I didn't focus a lot when we launched on, say, our screenshots or even our rating feedback in the app. I just wanted to get the app out on the store as soon as I could. I didn't care about even the app name at that point in time. I had just had it as music. So if I did those things early, perhaps I could be at a million monthly actives now because I noticed that doing them after made such a huge difference and doing them initially just, it could have made such a huger difference. So focusing on the little things before you launch instead of actually going and just rushing out and getting it on the score, the suboptimal metadata and whatnot, it, it just puts you a step behind from where you could have been with just a little more time. So I'd put hundreds of hours into Musi and then I'd put 10 minutes into my app store description and information and then I would just launch. So if I could have spent more time on that and taken another day, that would have been huge. Awesome. That, that's another great lessons learned. Um, so as much of the time that you put in building your app, you need to take as much time to make sure that it's optimized for the app store. Think description, think taglines, think screenshots. Um, so thank you very much for that, Aaron. Um, we are running a little bit over our half an hour, but we have a couple questions that are uh, coming through through Twitter that I would like to ask if you have a couple more minutes, Aaron. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. How did you come up with the design for your icon? Okay, so this one was actually really fun. Um, initially, what we tried, well, we looked at all these other music apps, and they were all the play button and whatnot, so I was thinking, hey, that's, that's cool. I'll, I'll go and do something like that. And then it just looks so generic and so bad. And we were, like, our logo was, like, an M, too. So I was thinking, hey, what if we do, like, a little M? That would look really cute. And then none of those really stuck. So then eventually my friend was just, like, trying these weird things. And he came up with this squiggle that looked like a play button and an M combined. So it was just really, really random. And that's how we actually came up with our logo. And I think it's great. Like, I, I love it. It's so fun. So it was so random, and it turned out so well. Awesome. And it's, it's always nice to hear kind of those, those personal stories um, when you're learning about how apps came to be. And uh, thank you for sharing that story with our audience. Um, so next question. You said there was no user acquisition budget. What kind of app promotion did you think about? Um, app promotion, like I said, it was just always going on these message boards and whatnot. Um, I'd send a bunch of sort of links and information about my app to various review sites, and we were picked up by a few. So I guess just the usual, like I'm sort of not sure in terms of what everyone has tried, but just the usual channels like app review, YouTubers, anyone that would potentially have any reach to your customers. Um, and then also TV was huge. And local newspapers, I guess, even like university newspapers, they were all clamoring for content. So mm -hmm. if we said, hey, here's this launch, and we basically wrote their story for them, and of course, they would go and post it. So basically, just everything that I thought would have eyes on it, I tried to get my app into when it launched. Because I had no budget. So I was just trying to get anyone to do anything. Yeah, it, it sounds like it's a lot of effort, but it's effort that can be handled, and, you know, you did that. Uh, and you're, you're the one-man show, and you were able to, you know, achieve these large numbers down the road. So um, to everybody on the call, you know, it's a, it's a big, you know, a, a big thing to try to do, but it is doable, and it is achievable, and Aaron did it. So um, we encourage all of you guys to, to do the same and think about the things that Aaron just mentioned. Um, so last question. What kind of research goes into developing an entertainment app? Yeah, so knowing, I think knowing the audience was huge and just knowing um, 
essentially sort of like I was I was surrounded by potential users, so I had a good idea of what people were wanting. So just that research that would go into actually sort of knowing what the customer wanted was huge. So definitely connecting with my target market before I actually launched the app, just to get that feedback. Um, and then also knowing I was even using your own app is something that's huge too. Because I'm entertained all the time by music. So I'm I'm entertained by like YouTube and SoundCloud, right? Yeah. So I would know myself. So making an app that you can use yourself, if it entertains you, chances are it'll entertain others. And that works with any really any any genre of that. If you use it, chances are others will. So building something that you'll use yourself goes such a long way. And then also surrounding yourself with your target market as well really, really helps because you can just bounce feedback and talk to them. Absolutely. Well, Aaron, on behalf of uh, Help Shift, thank you so much for joining us on this webcast. I know that I learned a lot, and I, I hope that our audience on the call learned a lot as well. Um, any last thoughts? Uh, no, you know, I think, I think we covered it. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, and to everybody on the call, as I mentioned, this is our third webcast in a series of five. Uh, so next week I will be hosting Matt Fairchild from TinyCo to discuss how your community can be your competitive advantage. So be sure to stay tuned for that email invitation coming to you shortly. Um, and Aaron, again, thank you so much and best of luck to you. And I look forward to hearing about the future success of Musee. Excellent. Thanks once again for having me. It's been great. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, on the call. This was recorded, and we will be posting it up to our blog and social channel shortly. Have a wonderful day.